I think I'm getting old. You know how you tell yourself a few minutes before, I got to do something, and then you forget all about doing something? Don't get old. That's all. Praise the Lord. <laughs> how many of you believe that God's arms are open wide? Now I'm going to ask that again. How many of you really believe that God's arms are open wide? I wasn't actually asking that for an applause. What I was really looking at is, do you believe in your own life where you're standing today that God's arms are open wide, no matter how you feel, no matter how you think, no matter what has happened in your life, that his arms are open wide. I didn't always believe that. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm trying to absorb it because that's what I've been kind of studying. When I look at the Old to New Testament, I look at Genesis to Revelation, it is truly a love story. And Satan has done his best to distort that. He has done his best to destroy mankind. God's creation. And God has done an equal and if not better job of trying to communicate to us that he loves us in spite of anything that we've ever been through. Amen? His arms are open wide. It doesn't matter what you feel, it doesn't matter what you think, and it doesn't matter what you've experienced. That is so true. Whether you believe it or not, it's always amazing. You can be an atheist and believe there is no God, but you're going to have to face him one day. Right? You can believe his arms aren't open to you because you have a target on your back or whatever, and the enemy has got your bound to not believe what God is all about, but he's there anyway. All right. Pastor Ryan started this series on be ready because we are trying to be ready for the next chapter here at Calvary. We're trying to be ready for what is happening in our world today. And boy, this last 24 hours has been horrendous with the violence that we have seen. But no matter how much the dark world gets, no matter how dark the world gets, it just means God's light shines all the brighter, doesn't it? And we have a hope. My hope for you is that you can look at the news and not be depressed. But you can look at it and say, praise the Lord, he is coming soon. And that he is the solution to all these problems. He is the true solution. So Ryan decided, you know, in his sermon series, Ready, to do what I did at the GROW conference on Tuesday night which is on wholeness and healing, because it is important for us to be whole in order to be ready. If we are still living by all our hurts and we're still victims in our society today, then we're not ready to fight the battle that God wants us to fight. And so God wants us to be able to do that. The second reason why we're doing this is because when the GROW conference uh, happened, the recording didn't, get, didn't stick, so we're going to do this again. So if you've already heard this, praise the Lord. You can sleep, use your cell phones, whatever. No, don't do that. Because God's got a fresh vision for what he wants to do in our lives, to be ready for what is happening in our world today and in our church. I want to take us to, um, and you don't have to go here because isn't, it's just something I looked at last night. And so I added it to this, um, to this message because I, I was reading this in, Ex in Mo yeah, Exodus 3. When Moses was at the burning bush and something amazing happened, the burning bush sp spoke to him. And I don't know if you've ever had that type of experience where it's like something very unusual happened and, and it was God speaking to you. But here is what the Lord said, because you know the Israelites had been in bondage for 430 years. And here is what God said to Moses, and the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. 
So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Isn't that neat of the Lord? He doesn't just heal us, but he brings us into a whole new experience. He said to the Israelites, I'm going to bring you out of your bondage. I'm going to bring you out of your suffering. But not only that, I'm going to bring you to a land that I've ordained for you. A land that I am going to give to you. And that's the exchange that God has for us. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. We want to talk about healing and wholeness because what happened in Exodus 23, they, they moved away from, the Israel, the, uh, from Egypt and they were headed to the promised land and they came to this mountain Sinai and I don't know if you know, Moses is on the mountaintop and he's getting the instruction from the Lord. And part of the instruction in Exodus 23 were these words. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. In other words, what he's saying is, I know that you've experienced a lot, but I am going to deliver you from the enemies in this land. There are those that are in this land that are in your way. There are experiences that you're going to have that are going to be in your way. How many would see, that's pretty, that's pretty exciting, man. The Lord's going to drive them out. He's going to drive out our enemies. But here's what he said in verse 29. But I will not drive them out in a single year. Because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out before you until you've increased enough to take possession of the land. I got to tell you something, God knows your heart. I don't know if you know this, but God knows your heart. He knows what you need. Do you remember when they were, they were coming out of Egypt and, and there were two ways that they could go and God saw that and he says, you know, I know there's a shorter way for you to go, but that's the way of the Philistines and you're not going to be able to make it because you'll get too discouraged and turn back. So I'm going to bring you the longer way. He cared enough about them. He knew the condition of their hearts. He knows the condition of every person that came out of bondage. None of them were, were, were born into freedom. None. And some of us today have never experienced freedom in certain areas of our lives. Some of us today are still hurting. Some of us today are still struggling with what you think about yourself. Some of you need the touch from the Lord to heal you. And he does it progressively. How many of you believe God can do it instantly? I believe. I believe. This is on tape, hopefully, Jared. <laughs> this is on tape this time. I believe that God can, can instantly heal us. But for the most part, what he does, he takes us on a journey. Sometimes we lust after the destination, but the journey is where the healing happens. If we're looking so much on what we want, we're, we're, we forget and our eyes are taken off of the deliverer. And I think that's what happened is that they were hurting so much that if they were to inherit that whole land all at one time, they wouldn't have been able to take it over because they weren't strong enough. And that's what God is saying. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you've increased enough to take possession of the land. God cares about us and where we are right now. So there are several obstacles to readiness is what we want to talk about today. The first one is brokenheartedness. We already know that there is hurt in our world today. There is hurt in your life today. I mean, when we look at the headlines, every single one of us should be able to say, I praise the Lord even though the darkness exists because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We hurt, but that's why God's love came. That's why he said immediately after the sin of Adam and Eve, he was going to send his son that he was going to repair the damage. The love letter from Genesis to Revelation says that I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've endured. I don't care what you, what you're, where your heart is right now. I don't care what you believe about yourself. I know. And I don't care what relationships you have right now. I have come to redeem it all. 
He is the one that redeems our broken hearts. There's trauma, there's loss, and we spend all our times trying to make sure that we don't feel those things. I think God's right behind there. We spend all this time trying to deny that we hurt. But you know something? If you deny your feelings, you're denying a core part of your personality, one-third of your core personality given to you by God himself because he gave us the capacity to feel, to think, and to do. And so you can deny it all you want. You know, you can deny your pain. You can drink. You can take drugs. You can do anything that you want to escape your pain. The only thing is the darkness that's inside of you is going to come out. Do you know why? Because we have a God that cares about us. Because I don't know whatever darkness that you might have and what you believe about yourself, but I know that the Bible says that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. So when you invite him in, he's going to come in. He's going to expose things. It's okay to be able to deal with it, to allow him to take you on a journey of healing. The second thing is our broken thoughts. Some of us really don't like who we are. Some of us have thoughts that just run amok and, and we don't really, we believe lies. But I'm here to tell you that God has the truth in us. It's planted in us. Now I know that there are some people that struggle with this even on a biochemical level. I know that we have depression and anxiety that you know, we need some assistance from. But when we look at God's word, we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that what he says about us is the truth. And this is the thing that frustrates me the most when I'm talking with people. Because what I have to repair is that there are people in their lives, in your lives, that have said things about you that is not true. And we believe a flawed human being before we believe an almighty God that knows who we are because he created us in his image and his likeness. There is nothing, nothing that anybody has ever said to you that is true if it does not line up with what God says about us. It is time we believe that. Because it's ruining us. It's causing us to stay victims instead of victors in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to change your mind. I want to help you with the truth. And finally, there's broken relationships. And what better way for Satan to operate than in broken relationships? Because if he can keep us separate, if he can keep us in conflict, the hurt, the disconnection, and the isolation, then he can win the battle. Satan will win the battle. But I don't think anybody here wants Satan to win the battle, right? We want the Lord to be there. So what is God's solution for our readiness? Well, for a broken heart, it's healing, right? God wants to heal us. In Psalm 34, there's verses 15 to 18. It says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The ears are attentive to their cry. Folks, do not let the enemy fool you. He will tell you. The enemy himself will tell you, well, he hasn't done much about it so far. He must not hear us, and, you know, and I've talked to a lot of people, been through a lot of things. And it's amazing what faith can do when we build it through what we have been through. But sometimes I may not believe, the Lord attentive to my cry. I've been crying for years, and he still hasn't heard me. Yes, he has. The enemy is going to try to tell you he hasn't. His ears are attentive to their cry, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from some of their troubles. I always love you. You're always, always sharp. Let me check. Oh, all of their troubles. I kind of call that the reverse version because sometimes we need to kind of look at the all-inclusiveness. And Pastor Kuhn did that for us when he had one verse last week and he had us, you know, look at how many times it's all, always. It's like God is always there. He delivers us from all our troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You may not feel like it, but you have to believe that if you're hurting today, he is close to your broken heart and he desires to touch it. Now, I don't know why God does what he does, but he does it. 
I can't tell you, after all these years of helping people, I can't tell you how God does it. He just does it. For every individual person, it's different. But for some reason, people tell their stories, and they're able to just kind of like, wow, this is, this is so cool. God touches it. Psalm 147, praise the Lord. How good is it to sing the praises to our God? How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You know what binds up means? It means to bandage, to wrap his arms around. It's like God wants to just kind of wrap his arms around your heart as you're going through what you're going through. Remember what I'm saying, folks. The destination is the healing, but the most important part of it is the journey. When God was taking them into into the promised land, he had to strengthen them every day because there was a new battle to face. And what I'm going to talk about next week is that we have to be warriors, folks, because the world is dark. If we're not strong in the Lord, we're going to be in trouble. But this is one of those areas. Don't let the enemy discourage you. Stay the course. God is with you. He's with your broken heart and he will help you through it. But Ecclesiastes 7 is a weird verse. It says, better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies so the living should take this to heart. Listen to this carefully. Verse 3, sorrow is better than laughter for sadness has a refining influence on us. (laughs) I love that. The NIV says this, a sad face is good for the heart. And I'm going, wait a minute. You know, God said to the Israelites, he rebuked them. He says, you dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, you say, when there is no peace. And God is saying here in his word that it is better to feel to go through what it is you're going through because we master denial we pretend nothing hurts we are tough people we will make sure that we anesthetize our pain in every way that we possibly can and the only thing that truly works is the healing of the lord jesus christ that touches the very heart of what we are going through that's it So learn to tell your story. Folks, here's my, here's my wish. My wish is that every single person in this room and every single person in the church would be safe enough for me to tell my story. Without judgment, without doctrinal deference to some other thing like, yeah, it's too blessed to be stressed. Why are you doing that? I'm too blessed to be depressed. I shouldn't deal with my feelings. You should give them to the Lord. Why dwell in the past? I can give you the collection of all the things I've heard over 30 years. But here's what the Lord says. I am close to the brokenhearted. See, if you don't allow your heart and tell your story and allow people around you to tell that story because that's how people are set free. I don't know how he does it, like I said, but you know, people will tell their story and all of a sudden they're starting to feel better. It's like, we just need that outlet. The Bible says, but bear one of those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Do you know what bearing one of those burdens means? It actually goes to a cross reference in James that says we love our neighbors as ourselves. The way that we love our neighbor is to listen to the story, to bind up, to help the Lord to deal with those wounds. We need to learn how to be emotionally validating, folks. We need to learn how to listen. And folks, we need to learn how to listen to somebody without interrupting with our own story. (laughs) I've I've seen a lot of 90, 10 situations. You've probably been in them where you're trying to talk to somebody and you really have a burden. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, probably about a few minutes in, they're starting to talk about their story. It's important to be safe not to trump another person's story. Let them tell the story, and then you'll be able to tell yours. But maybe we should pray for one another too. James had it right. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. And that's what we need to do. 
We need to be able to follow our triggers. Something happens and usually we kind of get angry and judgment happens and I don't know why I keep going there and why this thing keeps happening to me, but the triggers are always coming up. Oh, look at it this way. God is squeezing us. He wants to bring out something in us. He needs to, we need to be healed of something. God will make sure that it comes up. And by the way, our spouses might just bring it up I don't know if Dorothy's here, but I don't like it. <laughs> People bring it up. Have you ever been angry because somebody confronted you on something? And all, all we do is get angry back. And it's like we've never learned a bit about ourselves, have we? Finally, in this, core hurts to core values. And, and, and I really love this, uh, this thing. I say that to a lot of people. This is Stephen Stasny's concept. He's a, he's a psychologist in D.C., but what he basically was saying is, in one of his books, is that what we do is we look at life through our core hurts all the time. We have filters, and we're just waiting to be rejected. We're waiting to be abandoned. We're waiting to be hurt. We, we are just so focused on it that we're living by our core hurts, and you will never get better because you will never, ever be a victor. You will always have the identity of victim. And I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we should never allow another person to define who we are. Do not live by your core hurts. I am sick and tired of people living that way, but I understand why it happens. Because we've been trained by it. You know, what he says is that we need to transfer that to live by our core value. It is time we understand who God says we are. And we live by our value, not by our hurts. We transform those things. Look at what Isaiah 61, Jesus taught this in the temple. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion. Bestow on them. Listen to this carefully. You look at the exchange. God brought the Israelites out of bondage and brought them to a land. He exchanged their experience. He didn't just bring them out of bondage and then left them by themselves. He says, I'm going to bring you out and I'm going to bring you somewhere. And so look at this. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. You're, you, you may see your life as ashes. You may see yourself as destroyed by all the experiences in life. But what God wants to do is transform it into a crown of beauty and only he can do it. And he wants to do it. So that's healing. What do we do with our thoughts? Well, here's what, what God wants. He wants us to be transformed. Transformation is important when it comes to our thoughts. Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing, perfect will. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. That's an active word. It means that we have to arrest it. With a, anybody have runaway thoughts? All right. Everybody probably does, right? It's, it's difficult. We have to take control of it. We have to work it. We have to work what we need to have happen in our minds. But we're taking captive every thought to make it obedient to what? Not to my mom and dad, not to my friends, not to my spouse, not to my kids, not to my coworkers, but make it obedient to Christ. That's what he wants to do. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true... Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. 
And here's the amplified in this, which I think is really interesting. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word. I love that phrase. Whatever is right and confirmed by God's word. If you are believing something about yourself right now that does not line up with God's word, then you are believing a lie and God wants that changed and transformed. Because we'll never be ready to fight the real battle out here. We need to be warriors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be the strongest people on the face of this earth. And we're going to have people that are going to come into the church that are hurting that we need to help. And that's the discipleship that I'm talking about. It's being able to help each other through it. Whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually. That's an interesting word. On these things. You know what continually means in the original language? Center your mind on them and implant them into your heart. Implant the truth into your heart. There is the key. We've got to start thinking better thoughts. We've got to start reading the word. We've got to start implanting into our hearts God's truth so that we do not believe. You know, it is lazy. We are lazy people because we're going to believe a lie. That's the easiest thing to do. It takes work to believe the word, doesn't it? You have to work it. Satan, all he has to do is get us to do nothing. But we've got to take captive. See, those are active things. Captive, transform. And think continually on those things. And how do we do that? There's just three words in your notes. One is recognize. We need to recognize the difference between a lie and a truth. And I know people that sometimes are believing that the lie is the truth. Because you have believed it and you've seen it all your lives. How do you know when it is the truth? You know how you can tell? I think the biggest way that you can tell is what the Bible says. The truth will set us free. (laughs) You know? The truth sets us free. The lie, how's that working for you? So when you, when you believe something that is not true, you still feel bound by it. You think it's true. You look in the mirror and you don't like what you see. You think it's true. Somebody had come up to me at the, uh, after the 9 o'clock service says Dr. Jeremiah was saying the same thing today. And, and he used this analogy. He says, you know, you can go and have plastic surgery and change your looks. He says, but the problem is you're still going to believe what you believe about yourself. So you can change your looks, you can change your actions, but the thing that has to change is the heart and the thoughts. And you have to believe and work it. We've got to recognize that the lie has not worked and will never work. It continues to discourage us. I figure the truth is the biggest thing that that we have going for us. Amen? And then we have to renounce. Once we recognize the lie, we have to renounce it. We have to break its agreement. For some reason, the easiest thing to do is to believe the lie. Because we've done it all our lives, right? Hey, folks, I got to tell you, we are in a warfare. How many know that? And next week, we're going to talk about that a little bit. We need to be stronger than what we are today in order to be a part of this war. And part of that war is that we have made agreements with the lies of our past. And God comes into our lives and what he expects us to do is to not believe those lies anymore but to believe his word and study it. And then finally to renew, we're replacing with the truth what God sees about us. All right, last thing we're gonna talk about is connection. We've talked about how healing is, is really helping out the brokenhearted. We talk about transformation when it comes to our broken thoughts, but connection is important when it comes to broken relationships. God is into that. We were separated at the garden. Folks, I know that I've said this over and over again, but we were never designed to be in this world what we are today. Body, soul, and spirit, we're supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. Some, two people kind of messed that up. And now we're, we're living in the way God created us, 
but we're living in a sinful world that doesn't fit. That's why grief doesn't work for us. That's why pain is difficult to deal with. But we have to realize that God has sent his son to redeem every single one of them. He said he did not come for the well. He came for the sick, you know, so that we can be a hospital in this church to welcome people in so that we can have the connection that will heal us totally. Amen. And Larry Crabb said this. He says, we are hurt in relationships, but we're healed in relationships. So what we do is we tend to get hurt and we isolate. And if we isolate, we don't get the healing that we need. And that's why I see the power of my office. Because I can, we can connect with people and really transform their thoughts and really help them to tell their stories and things start to happen just in a healthy relationship, just for somebody believing in them. And that's what we need to be with the church, with every single one of you being that positive influence on somebody. So in conclusion, we wanna look at three attitudes. Number one is the attitude of unity. And I'm not going to cover a lot of that because Pastor Kuhn did a wonderful job last, last couple of weeks covering unity. If we are not unified, we're not going to be able to deal with life in this world because the darkness comes. You can't be an isolated island onto yourself. You cannot do it. You will not survive. Ecclesiastes says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help them up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The attitude of unity covered by Pastor Kuhn, very, very important. Secondly, the attitude of humility. It is time that we humble ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love the scripture in Philippians 2 because I've always believed that if every single relationship in this room could, could just practice this one verse, we would have good relationships. And here it is. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value ourselves over others. Oh, I'm just, I'm just sharing you how we live it. Isn't it true that so many times we're valuing ourselves over others? We're, we're so, perfect, we're so self-protected. We're so defensive. You know, we don't ever value ourselves. And, and it says here that in humility, value others above yourselves. You know how that works? It works because if Dorothy thinks about me and values herself, me more than herself, and I do the same thing to her, isn't it true that our needs could be met? Right? I know that doesn't exactly work because everything I'm talking about, there's always something that you're going to say it's something about, right? Yeah, but I've tried. <laughs> I've tried and my spouse won't come around. <laughs> then keep trying. Aren't you glad that God died for us even though you are a sinner? And that you keep turning your, your, away from the Lord? That's the model. Because here's what it says. Not looking to our own interest, but also to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. The savior of this world made himself nothing to serve us. Why do we elevate ourselves and think that we're better than anybody else? And I tend to think it's because we don't really like who we are. It's just a mask, isn't it? But I guess if that's true, if we learn truly who we really are, aren't we going to love each other better? Because Jesus in the, in the second greatest commandment said what? We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that's not boastful and proud. That's just, that's just understanding who you are in Christ. And the last one that we're going to talk about is the attitude of reconciliation. Now, I know fully that these three areas, healing, transformation, connection, we could have taken a whole week for each one. I just don't have that much time because Pastor Ryan's going to be coming back. All right? 
But I'm going I'm to tell you, you can take these things and study them. Study them. But the attitude of reconciliation is absolutely important. Why? Because this is where everything comes together. In Ephesians 4, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of some of your bitterness, rage, and anger. Get rid of most of your bitterness, rage, and anger. Do you, do you realize what you're saying? Some of you are saying all, but you know you have something inside of you. <laughs> you know what I find? That sometimes when you study the word, it actually exposes what's going on inside of you. Maybe that's why sometimes we don't spend as much time as we need to. Because we're afraid of what it's going to expose inside of us. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. There's a lot there. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God gave to you. In the, in the New Living Translation, it says, do, do, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Folks, your kids are hearing what you're saying to one another. People around you are listening. And if you're a believer and you're supposed to be discipling other people and you're saying things like gossip and, and all that maliciousness about another person, you know who's listening? The unsaved world who will think you're a hypocrite. And that's why it's important to guard our heart and mind and say only those things which will build one another up. And marriage is the same thing. Don't forget, we are to say positive things to one another. I know, I know that there are issues, but get help. Seek help. Do what you can do because this is God's word. It says to get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Now I know and I realize that not everybody is going to be able to, you're going to get, be able to get rid, um, <sighs> get along with, right? Because Paul did say, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love those first four words, if it is possible. You make the effort if it is not possible and it's violating God's word in your life, you, have to, you do something about it. Every single one of you has a unique situation. It's, it's hard to put this into one lump sum and say this is what you need to do. But I want you to seek after God for your situation today. Amen? Amen? Let's stand today. We, we, we held back one worship song, if you notice that we had a shorter set at the beginning because we want the last song to kind of be at the end because I want it to be a prayer. I want this to be your proclamation to the Lord as to what you need to do with this. How many of you believe it is well with your soul? When I did this on, on Tuesday night at the Grow Conference, we had a tremendous altar call because I believe that it is something we want to believe and you might say to yourself, yeah, it's not right with my soul. You know, I sinned the other day or I did this or I have this attitude or I have these thoughts or my heart is broken. No. What you don't understand is that we want to look at this from God's perspective. He says it is right with your soul. Why? Because Christ died for you. It is time that we make the proclamation that, yes, I want to walk in victory. I don't want to walk a victim anymore. 
I don't want to walk outside these doors and believe the old things again. It is right with my soul. I'm going to struggle. I'm still going to sin. I'm still going to have hurt. I'm still going to have pain. I'm still going to think negative thoughts. But you know what I'm doing today is I'm making a commitment to start fresh, to be ready for what is coming in our world, to be ready for what's coming here to Calvary, to make a move in your own personal life that honors God, no matter what you go through. So you may have a broken heart, You may have thoughts that you can't control and they're negative. You might have a broken relationship. As we we sing this, I want you to come to the altar. We're going to pray for you. Okay, we won't delay it. We'll only be here till two. All right. So, no. But this is serious stuff because I believe God wants to touch you right now. But you have to make that action. Believe the words that are being sung here. Accept it for yourself because this is what God sees for you. Amen? Let's sing that.